Good morning and welcome to FPC. The Lord is good. All the time. It is my joy to welcome those who are with us online. Remember, we are a community that worships together in person and online. Many weeks when we gather, I often like to remind you that you are being welcomed into not something that's just this morning, but something that's been going on for a long time. I like to remind us that God has prepared this place, that God has acted, and we are responding to a God who has reached out and loved us and welcomed us here. That is still true today, but today I get to welcome you into something that started on Friday afternoon. This building has been full of discussion and dialogue and celebration of art, of celebration of of faith. It has been just a rich and glorious and wonderful weekend. And this is, the wave is still going. So whether you have been in this building since Friday afternoon, and some of us feel that way, whether you have been in here since Friday afternoon, or whether you are catching the very end of the wave, you're still on the wave. And we have just had an incredible weekend. We have heard from world-class musicians We have heard the stories of Jesus followers who have vulnerably shared the story of their journey, of their pilgrimage, of their pain, of their suffering, of their celebration, of their joy. We have been blessed with dance, with visual art, with song, with stories. Most of us have laughed. We have cried. We have connected with someone that we did not know before this weekend. It has been just a glorious and rich weekend, and you're a part of it. So welcome to it. Whether you are just joining in, you are now a part of something that has been glorious and rich and just incredibly full. So I wanted to welcome you to that. I also wanted to just acknowledge that it was all made possible by the work of our Commons Committee and specifically the work of a woman named Nikki Lane who applied for this grant and got it and dreamed of doing this. And Nikki had a rich and wonderful weekend. She was also sick during the weekend, so life crept in, and her son had his appendix taken out last night. So life, life crept in in all sorts of ways. So would you join me? Jude is doing fine. He's doing great. Jude is doing very well. But would you join me as we pray for the Lang Terpstra family that has had a long weekend and all is well? Would you join me? Lord, we are thankful that in your grace, you were able to get Jude to the right place. You are thankful for medical care and for ways that people were able to enter in to keep him safe. Be with Nikki, who is tired and has been through a whole lot this weekend. And yet, fill her up, Lord, and may she know the joy of a job incredibly well done and the ways that her dream has come to reality through the grace of your spirit. In your name we pray, and all God's people said, amen. We are continuing this chance to listen, to pray, to enter in. I want to invite us just to spend a moment of silence inviting God's Spirit to work in our midst. And we have a wonderful morning set up for us. Let us just take a moment of silence. Holy Spirit, Prepare our hearts, prepare our bodies, prepare our minds, prepare our our very beings for what you are doing this morning. Help us to be ready. And let us enter his gates with thanksgiving. Let us enter his gates with praise. Let us say, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad. And God's people said, amen. We have done an embodied worship thing every single week of Lent. And the theme for today is oil. And we're going to be, we're going to be using an embodied practice with oil in two ways, at the beginning of the service and at the end of the service. Um, At the beginning of the service, if you would like to come forward, as we have been talking about the works of our hands, we are going to be anointing hands. So if you would like to, you are invited to come forward, have your hands anointed. The oil is from Bethlehem. It smells like myrrh because it's myrrh. That's why it smells like that. Um, It is myrrh from Bethlehem. And you are invited just to come forward if you would like to have your hands anointed just to celebrate God's work in the midst as we co-create 
with the Creator. Would you stand if you are able and let us sing, and you're invited to come forward for the next two songs if you would like to.
have confessed our sins to a gracious and merciful God, and I want you to hear this clearly. As far as the east is from the west, so far has God removed our sins and transgressions from us. Brothers and sisters, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We celebrate that. We have been reconciled with God, and we celebrate that by the grace, mercy, and power of our loving God. We have been reconciled with each other. We do that every week in the practice of the ancient practice of passing the peace. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Please pass it with those around you and make sure you come forward and wave to those on Zoom for we have been reconciled with them as well. We are a community that is sharing a living faith across generations. We do that, one, by memorizing scripture together. Here is our verse for the fine month of March. Our verse is from Mark 6, 8. Let us say it together. He ordered them to take nothing for their journey except a staff. No bread, no bag, no money in their belts, but to wear sandals and not to put on two tunics. And we have a question that goes with that, an intergenerational question. Here's our intergenerational question. What would help you to travel more lightly? And I'd like to ask you to, to do me a favor. I'd like you to just go, oh, Doug, just right now. One, two, three. Okay, now I'm going to have you sit and find someone next to you in groups of two or three and share your answer to that question. And you don't need to say, oh, Doug, because you've already done it. Make sure everyone's included. Find two or three people and share that question.
Okay, 15 seconds, 15 seconds. Finish up your thought, 15 seconds. Okay, we love having all age kids as a part of our worship. We also recognize that it is gonna be most valuable for them to be an age appropriate worship. So it is the chance and the time that we send our kids down for godly play worship. And so third through fifth graders are going through this door up here. First, second graders and younger are going through the back door, but we're gonna send them off with this blessing. Let us share this blessing for the kids and for the mentors who are leading them. The Lord be with you as you learn and live Christ's story. And the kids get to respond, one, two, three. Go! Not only, not only are we forgiven, but we are invited to participate in what our Lord is doing in this world. We don't believe that we are necessary, but we, are, we believe we've been invited to participate. And as we do that, we get to celebrate in using the gifts that we've been given to share them and to build up those around us. Let us be chewing and thinking about how we can do that. While we do that, we'll be receiving our offering, our time, our talents, our treasures. But I want to especially emphasize that we have been taking an offering for a Chitul. Chitul is a small village in Guatemala. Many of our church folks here are sponsoring a child in Chitul. We are sponsoring a child in the same village. And every year we do a service project to try to help this Group. Food for the Hungry is with this village for just 10 years. And in 10 years, they are trying to make this village able and more productive and more developed. We have been trying to raise $8,000, and my news today is we did it! Don't give any more money to Chitul now. Wait till next year. Um, but thank you so much. We are thrilled. We, and, and our group of 10 folks from our church are going as ambassadors for the first time. We haven't been able to go because of COVID. We're going for the first time the week after Easter to go and to meet with the village leaders and to meet with this town and just to say how much we love them, how much we care about them. Be praying for Chitul. Be praying for the people of Chitul. The money that we have given is going to go to build a safety fence to make their village safer and, and um, a place where kids can roam more freely. So we are excited about that and thank you for your generous gift there where this week is God inviting you to offer up your time, your talents, or your treasures? I invite our ushers to come forward.
Our scripture reading for today is Exodus 31, verses 1 through 11. Let us hear the word of the Lord. The Lord spoke to Moses, See, I have called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah, and I have filled him with divine spirit, with the Holy Spirit, with ability, intelligence, and knowledge in every kind of craft, to devise artistic designs, to work in gold, silver, and bronze, in cutting stones for setting, and in carving wood in every kind of craft. Moreover, I have appointed with him Oholiab, son of Ahizamach, of the tribe of Dan, and I have given skill to all the skillful, so that they may make all that I have commanded you. The tent of meeting, and the ark of the covenant, and the mercy seat that is in on it, and the furnishings of the tent, the table and its utensils, and the pure lampstand with all of its utensils, and the altar of incense, and the altar of burnt offering with all its utensils, and the basin with its stands, and the finely worked vestments, the holy vestments for the priest Aaron, and the vestments of his sons for their service as priests, and the anointing oil, and the fragrant incense for the holy place. They shall do just as I have commanded you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We have been celebrating this whole weekend faith and art and the connection between those who are trying to live out and work out the mystery of life and the mystery of the Almighty and doing it in ways that invite us to go deeper, invite us. It has really been a celebration of the skillful being given skill by the Holy Spirit and by the work that they have put into it. And so, as a way to end this weekend, we thought, what better way than to talk to three of those skillful people? So I'm going to invite Ryan and Troy and Kristen to come forward, and I'm going to give you a chance to get to know them a little bit better. And we have some questions just to get to know some of these remarkable artists and the work that they have been doing. to make sure that we're on here so I'm not setting you up at all. Okay, Troy, I'm going to start with you right here. There we go. Okay, so I first got to hear about Troy Terpstra. Troy was the first one artist of this group that I heard about because I was on a trip to a place down in Burlington called Tierra Nueva. It's a part of our Presbytery's mission and partners with our Presbytery. And as I was wandering through Tierra Nueva, I came upon this mural that just knocked my socks off. And I thought, who is this? And they said, well, it's this remarkable artist. And then I discovered that his brother was a part of our church. I discovered that I knew his mother and father. And I was like, who is this amazing artist? And so I just started watching from afar. And Troy has grown and changed. He's finding his voice. I will say that we have a ton of incredible art up here. Troy's is this one up here in the corner, and it is, you need to spend some time just sitting and getting close and looking at what is going on here. He also has two pieces that are in the commons that you can look at. Um, but Troy, would you tell us a little bit of your background as an artist? Uh, sure, yeah. I, I think um, this painting, it's funny that this painting is here. This painting's always, Nikki asked to borrow it. It's always in my... Uh, house and um, it's a painting about growing up in church and having a, a father who's a pastor really uh, a little boy at the bottom who doesn't quite know what to do with himself uh, <laughs> while uh, the pastor gives a benediction it's called benediction I, I learned to draw by sitting in pews <laughs> um, <laughs> while my dad went on and on <laughs> And uh, there was a rule, my mother had a rule, that I could draw in church so long as um, my drawing had something to do with the sermon. <laughs> but he was a CRC minister, and I learned pretty quickly that no matter what the subject was, if I just drew a picture of Jesus dying on the cross, it was <laughs> going to be thematically completely accurate. <laughs> so I learned to do that very, very quickly, and then I could sort of secretly draw... Um, you know, aircraft carriers and uh, bazookas and things like that, and hide those ones. And they always thought I was paying attention. So, uh, yeah, that's 
That means, though, that my real skill is actually in Pictionary because I'm incredibly fast. <laughs> <sighs> but nobody ever, I should have little timer numbers next to each painting. But. No, so that's, uh, so I was a drawer always and a drawer in church always. And uh, it was actually that mural at Tierra Nueva where um, I felt like my vocation was kind of given to me because I didn't know, if you notice at the bottom of the stairs, there's a map of Mexico, which was the first mural I did. And it was very easy, and I thought, this was fun. And I didn't know what I was doing there, and Bob Ekblad, a lot of you probably know Bob Ekblad, sort of just gave me the time and space to work that mural out, and it took, the whole thing took about two years. I didn't know what I was doing. I erased the whole thing and drew it three times. And um, he was just very encouraging and sort of said, this is, you know, and so I feel like I am an artist who, in every way, sort of came out of the church, and that piece particularly is so community-driven, community-encouraged. Uh, uh, people were helping me out. They were giving me support. They were trying to get me to finish because I didn't think I could do it. So I feel, um, yeah, that's... And then I, I went to France after that, and that was really a big part of an art education, sort of when you live in France people visit you, and then you go to the, see the same museums over and over and over again, which is great. And I felt like that was really uh, an, a big part of my education. And yeah, I've been trying to paint ever since and study theology. Uh, I do improv. I've done improv for years and years, which I think I'll maybe say some things about that later, but I think that contributes a lot. And I think there's a lot that the um, principles of improv have to say to the church as we uh, as we live out our faith. Troy, thank you. Appreciate it. And I will just tell you, if you want to get in a conversation with Troy, mention the the theologian Rene Girard, and Troy will Troy will talk with you and have a lot of fun with it. And um, and Troy has a whole Troy did a whole series of paintings all around the Rene Girard stuff. It's truly incredible. Um, the next one is Ryan Pemberton. And I got to know Ryan when he was a part of this body. Ryan lived in Whatcom Park County. He was part of this body. He went off to do ministry in Berkeley, in California, all over the place. He is back in Seattle, and he's now working with Image Magazine, which, in, if you are not familiar with kind of the art and faith discussion, Image Magazine has been leading the way for the last 35 years. It has just been one of the most stalwart group of kind of periodical that has been having this discussion about art and faith. And so, Ryan, um, you are a writer, you are an editor, you, 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 your art is with words. Would you talk to us about your background as an artist? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Doug. And uh, thanks again for hosting this space, this time, this weekend. This has been such a rich treat for all of us who've been able to be a part of this. Um, yeah, many, many years ago, I was a part of the end community. And my first night at the end, I'll tell you, I sat right there it was the last seat in the house. Uh, it was just directly above the drums and a lot of great memories here. I've uh, been blessed by this church community for many, many years. So yeah, one of, one of the things I do is I work with words, um, try and line them up and dance uh, on my best days. Uh, I was a very curious child, so a lot of times in books, reading, if I wasn't playing sports, I was at the library. Um, and somewhere along the way, I, I started to try and uh, follow those writers who were helpful for me. So um, C.S. Lewis was a really big influence. I wouldn't say so much as writing, but just in terms of how he thought in his writing. Uh, I was, like I said, I was very curious, and I loved the way that uh, Lewis wrestled with ideas and thoughts and our faith tradition, and that, that was hugely formative. I ended up going to England to study theolo theology largely because of C.S. Lewis, whose work, by the way, this is a fun fact to share here, whose work I was introduced to in a casa in the inn. So that's a fun fact. Um, in the 808 apartments just across from, from Western. Um, yeah, and then, you know, also around this time, Donald Miller's writing was really popular. That sort of ages me, but that was my era uh, in college. So Blue Like Jazz, uh, a lot of spiritual memoir was really important to me, and Lamott I just found to be simultaneously um, hilarious and insightful. And then I went to, uh, like I said, uh, study theology in England, and then I did uh, another degree in 
Durham, North Carolina, and it was in my first semester in Durham that I was introduced to the work of Frederick Buechner. And it's not just that I fell in love with Buechner's eloquence, which I, I think many of the people in this room can probably agree with that, but in a book of his that I was introduced to, the very first line is, at its heart, all theology is autobiography. And, and that was the light bulb moment for me. It was like, yes, that's it. Which is not to say that when I write about my life, I'm writing about God, but somehow the God of Christianity is the God who reveals God's self in our lived experience. And so, one of our tasks, I think, is to pay attention to our lived experience and to be honest about our lived experience as a way of discovering that God and helping other people to encounter that God. So, that's been a, a bit of my journey in terms of my writing. Ryan, thank you. And lastly, but certainly not leastly, in any way, shape, or form, I got to see Kristen's work when I was touring the Grunewald Guild. And, um, and in there, and in many places, her work is big and startling and just wonderful. And I was like, who is this? And they're like, well, she lives in Bellingham. I was like, no way! Who is this person? Kristen has worked with Holden Village. Um, she lived there for seven years, and she's been working with the Grunewald Guild when she's not living and enjoying life in Bellingham. Kristen, what, what has influenced you? What is your background as an artist? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I come from a long line of Lutherans. Um, my grandfathers on all sides were Lutheran pastors. My father taught at a, at a Lutheran seminary, and all his brothers were pastors. There were no women pastors in the family. Um, and thus, I grew up steeped in that stuff. And so, of course, what did I do is run the other way. <laughs> I ran the other way. Actually, I was asking questions. Um, I had a lot of questions, and I didn't know how to ask them until I was much older. Um, and when that was, was um, my husband and I were living in North Idaho. He was building houses. I was having kids and all that stuff. And he went through a midlife crisis. So he said, why am I building houses for people that don't need them? <laughs> so, um, so we went back to a place we knew of called Holden Village for one year. One year. That's a Lutheran retreat center in the North Cascades. Beautiful place, wonderful place, questioning place. Well, I wasn't so sure about going because of my running the other way. My problems with organized religion, and in particular, Lutheranism, <laughs> the lack of mystical talk. So, in order to decide whether to stay for a year at Holden Village, I asked to go for a walk with the director. And I said, I'd like to talk about my faith and see if it's going to work here or not. Because I was not without faith um, at all. Um, and so she asked me really great questions. Well, she, <laughs> yeah, the question was, what do you believe? <laughs> And I went right to my art teaching. I, I teach art, I love art, I draw, I paint, I, I live in the visual world. Um, and I said, well, when I teach drawing, um, I have people do something called gesture drawing. And in that gesture, I have people try to see the inner essence of what they're drawing. Like, for instance, that tree over there. We were walking on a path <laughs> um, to a beautiful waterfall. That tree over there, see how it leans this way just a little bit and it has branches going off this way? You would take a mark and go like this. And there you're seeing into the very center of the being of that tree. And then I said, that's where God lives. That's what I believe. God is the essence inside of us. God is not us. God is not the tree. God is in with and through all things. I don't think I use those words, but guess what she said to me? She said, do you know there's a word for that? Do you know there's a name for that? And that that's what Luther thought? And I went, drop. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> what? And she said, yeah, the name for that is panentheism. Not pantheism, she said. Pa God in, with, and through all of life. And bam, I thought, I'm going to try this out. And she said, why don't you wear this cloak of, of Lutheranism for a year and see how it feels again. So we decided, and I agreed, to go for one year. And during that first year, Susan was her name, challenged me in the best ways, in a visual way. Um, I, my work was art. Uh, I, I was the artist in residence there. That was my job that year. And she said, she brought to me a cross, and I had told her that I just could not look at a cross because it was a symbol of execution. So she challenged me. She had a cross. It was a white cross with a white Jesus with red drips, strips of blood and flowers on it. <laughs> oh my goodness. She said, this is your job. You are going to make a painting and it has to be really large to fit in our gymnasium so everyone can see it. And it has to be a crucifix on which the wood is alive. And I thought, hmm. <laughs> so I lived with that, and I had a winter. I needed to have it done sometime for the summer. It's a good thing, because I struggled a long time. Um, so long, longer story, a little bit shorter. <laughs> um, I, I finally found my way when I, because all my things were, all my sketches were dark, smoky and dark, and Christ looking down and all that. Um, so finally I figured, I'm raising Christ's arms. I'm raising the arms of the cross. And I'm making those arms grow. And it grew into a tree. And it turned in, and Christ was in the middle. And Christ was in that tree. And it was rooted deep into the ground and branches reaching out into the sky. And it was totally alive. So that's a long story. I know I'm sorry. <laughs> but my, we ended up staying there nine years, not nine seven, years. but nine, nine, nine years. years. And my job continued to be to make art for the worship space. And it always had to be big. So I learned to make big works on silk, like 13 feet by 5 feet. Most of them were, and many of them, for this big, big space. Um, so then in, in uh, 20, 2007, we left. And um, I had made a lot of connections over those nine years, mostly church connections. And so um, I, people started asking me to make artwork for their churches. And I continue to do that until now. And I'm on my last commission. I'm not accepting any more commissions. Uh, but I, it's been a wonderful journey. Um, and you can see my work on my website, kristengilia.com. So if you're interested, I'll, I'll write it down for you or something. So that's what I do. And my mission, my artistic mission, is to connect sacred nature, God's creation, back into our humanly constructed sacred spaces. So that's what I've been doing since 2007. Amen. Oh, I love it. Um, the next question, each of you has touched on this, and so I don't know if you have any more to say on this or not, but where do you see the connection between faith and art? Wonderfully, I think you guys all sort of mentioned it, but anything extra you want to say about where you see the connection between faith and art? Yeah, it's a, obviously an enormous question to enormous uh, concepts. Or, but I think if I had to say something briefly about it, I would say that for, 
this is one of the things I talked about yesterday in this room, is that we live in a world where the burden of meaning is falling more and more on us cultivating our own story. You know, think about, I think about young people, smartphones and everything like, like that, and this sort of pressure to create an identity and a story themselves. Now that is a very heavy burden indeed, and it is something that I think art can help us think about. What I mean, here's what I, here's what I want to say, okay? N.T. Wright this, has this beautiful thing. In my tradition, there's a lot of anxiety about sort of what, what does it mean that the Bible is the word of God? And so he's trying, in an attempt to kind of illustrate how to think about the Bible as like the authority of our lives, when, what does that actually mean and how do we think about it? He gives this illustration. I want you to imagine that a new Shakespeare play has been found, and we know it's Shakespeare, but only the first four acts have been found. The fifth act is gone to history. It's lost forever, all right? And we want to put that play on. Now, how are we going to put that play on? We need to read and know those first four acts really well. We need to understand all the characterizations, all the subplots. We need to understand the storylines and the subtleties of all the things. But when it comes to putting that fifth act on, when we're performing it, we're going to have to do some improv. We're going to have to do some make em ups right? We're going to have to be courageous and just step out and say things and do things. So we are given a story that that is bigger than us that we are called to live into and our job as Christians is to be creatively bold, believe in our choices and to, to situate those choices in this text that we're so familiar in, in this tradition that we're coming out of, yes. But does that dictate everything we do and say robotically? Do we just repeat those earlier things? No, of course not. We understand it and then we move creatively and we take risks and we're bold. And we understand that our failure is definite. But we're going to try to do it anyways, right? Do not worry what you're about to say for the Holy Spirit is with you. That is the verse for me to be a Christian artist. And to be a Christian anything, it's no different. We are called to sort of live boldly into a story that is bigger than us. That We are not cultivating some... We're not, we don't have to, like... I think we have so blessed, we have such a profoundly rich tradition of the arts behind us to draw from, to copy, to imitate, to learn from, and then to boldly go forward and just to try things out and to do it. And I think... I think uh, there's a lot of power in that, um, in that uh, beautiful little analogy that N.T. Wright gives us. And I think it's a very, very helpful way to think about that intersection for me. Does that make I, sense? I love that. And I'm actually going to change the order of questions that I gave you because of what you just said, Troy. Um, as we talk about the spirit at work, how, we've, we've just listened to this passage of Bezalel. The first person to be filled with the Holy Spirit is an artist, a craftsman. How do each of you experience the Holy Spirit in your practice of art? We'll start with Ryan, and then we'll come back, Kristen, and then Troy. <laughs> thanks, for, thanks for the easy one. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think whether you're an quote-unquote artist or not, I think the call on all of our lives is to pay attention, right? This is one of the primary reasons we... We pray, we meditate, uh, we quiet ourselves down is to pay attention to what is the Holy Spirit's movement, movement among us. Um, and so I think, um, yeah, the poets help me to slow down, quite frankly. Um, again, writers like Frederick Buechner help, help me to pay attention. Buechner said, um, if you were to sum up the whole of my writing, the one thing I would be trying to say is this, pay attention. So I think, you know, those sort of writers help me to slow down and pay attention to the Holy Spirit's movement in my life. That's not something I can do on my own. I need, I need help with that sort of attentiveness. Left to my own devices, I am going too fast, I am distracted, so we need, 
I, I, I think we need all sorts of help focusing, and I, I think that's where writers have really helped me is to, to focus my attention uh, on the Holy Spirit's presence in my life and among us. Amen. Ryan, thank you. Kristen. So as we, 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 as we hear about Bezalel being filled with the Holy Spirit to do the art that, that he was called to do, how do you experience the Holy Spirit in your practice of, okay. of okay. co-creating, of making art? Yes. Oh, that's another question. <laughs> uh, how do I experience the Holy Spirit when I'm creating art? I feel that this Holy Spirit works through our imagination, whether we know it or not. I am a firm believer in this. I believe that the Holy Spirit nudges us this way, a little bit that way, and if we are listening, listening, both of you guys said that, slowing down. What do you do when you slow down? You slow down and you listen to, it's meditation. It's a prayer. I'm listening, Anne, for signs. And, and I'm also trusting. I'm trusting. I am not a co-creator. I am a tool. I have learned a craft. And I believe that I'm more a vessel and a tool for this imagination to come out. I believe I've been gifted with all those questions I had, and I finally found a place in art for, for what was going on in my head. Amen. Thank you, Kristen. I'm going to throw in a Frederick Beekner quote, yeah. who says he talks about being, being a conduit of the Holy Spirit. He said, but don't think of yourself as a garden hose. Think of yourself as a clogged drain pipe where you're trying to get out of the way yeah. so a little bit yeah. of the Spirit can drip through. Yeah. Such a wonderful, that's because Ryan had brought forth Frederick Buechner first. Troy, you've already kind of mentioned it, but is there a way that you experience the spirit in your painting? I mean, I, I think the, I think the, the gift of being able to act is, uh, is a thrill. Again, I think, for me, thinking about improv, thinking about, uh, like, if we're, if we're attempting to sort of live into this story in a prayerful way, I feel like the Holy Spirit shows up. The Holy Spirit shows up. If you think about, think about stained glass. You go to some Gothic cathedral, and you go into it, and you see this unbelievable... I mean, this is a beautiful piece of stained glass behind you, but you think about going into, you know, Notre Dame or Chartres or some place like that, and... I mean, what were they trying to do? Were they, were they, did they set out and be like, well, we're going to make the most beautiful things we've ever, that any of the human beings have ever made? No, what they were trying to do was to tell a story. They were trying to tell a story to a largely illiterate audience in the way that made sense with the materials that they had, you know, trying, representing the sort of thought that they had with the materials that they had as faithfully as they could with an incredible patience and incredible devotion. And what came out of it is something we can hardly believe. But they didn't, these, you know, craftsmen, and I don't know, I, I really don't believe that they were sitting there being like, how can we conceive of something that will be, do you know what I mean? Like, we don't, like, it's, it's not up to you, it's not your business. You are called to be faithful and to act. And if you don't know what to do, to go back and find what's interesting to you and to just copy it and figure it out, figure out how to do it. Like, there's, so you mentioned Rene Girard. I, this is one of the things I said yesterday I think is so interesting about our culture. Girard talks about, I'm gonna kind of insult the artist world a little bit here, but he says, in America, one of the last really creative arenas is the world of business. You wanna know why? Because in business, they're not afraid to copy each other. In business, they see their competitor doing something and they're like, wow, this guy's making money, he's successful, I'm gonna do what he's doing. But in the arts, we don't wanna do that. I don't wanna copy anybody, I gotta be original, I gotta do my own thing, I gotta, I gotta, you know, we have a profound geyser of, of material beauty behind us in every arena you can think of. 
Like, let's go back, let's understand it. Let's carry, it. This, is, this is the tradition we're in, and it's all about telling the story, participating in this story of Christ saving love. The Eucharist itself is like a profoundly creative act we all get to engage in. Like, let's, let's embrace what we've got and just move forward and keep trying things. And I think that's when, like, do not worry what you will say for the Holy Spirit is with you. The Holy Spirit is with us. It's showing up. Right? I don't think it's, I don't think it's uh, something to, be, to really worry about. I think, you know, it's time to get busy. And all God's people said, Amen. We have been challenged to pay attention. I'm going to invite our worship team forward, and they're going to, we're going to learn a new song about paying attention and being where our feet are. And I see our worship leader running down. <laughs> She'll be here soon. She is fast. But... Would you just offer a thanks to our artists? We could have gone on for a, a much longer time, but a thanks for, for our three artists. Thanks, thank you, all three of you. This has been rich. And we're going to just pay attention because we are preparing to come forward to what Troy has reminded us is the most creative act as we come to the table. This is a table that is an act of incredible imagination, creativity, and welcome. And we are invited to participate in that. Let's prepare our hearts and pay attention as we get ready to come forward to the table.
I want to invite you into our time of receiving communion, and it's going to be a bit different than we often do. We're going to give you options of different things to do. You are going to be invited to come forward. There will be four stations here in the front and one in the balcony. Whenever you're ready, you're invited to come forward, and there will be a tray with a gluten-free cracker and a cup in the middle, and you can dip it in the cup. And instead of just taking the communion there, I want to invite you to walk around everywhere, even up on the chancel, find a piece of art, and just do something that we've been calling Visio Divina. Just stare at it, look at it, ask God, what are you speaking? How, notice it, be where your feet are, and just drink it in. And remember that works of art are human beings as well. And I think that's going to have everyone lining up to just watch Milo, who is also an amazing work of art. <laughs> but spend some time doing that. You can also come forward. Carrie and I, Pastor Carrie and I will be anointing. Instead of hands, we'll be anointing heads as a reminder of God's anointing on our imagination. That will be happening here. You can also light a candle in memory and prayer and remembrance right over here. Um, and then we're going to have a longer time than normal. The band will be playing, but it's going to be a longer time to just take in and receive communion in front of some piece of art that, and allow God to speak to you in the midst of that. This creative act that Troy reminded us was very simple. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, and after having given thanks, he broke it, handed it to his disciples and said, this is my body. Take and eat. And then he said something so fascinating. Do this in remembrance of me. And at the same meal, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant shed with my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this also in remembrance of me. It's the Apostle Paul who reminds us every time we take the bread and every time we drink from the cup that we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes again. Lord, as we receive these gifts, we give thanks, we praise your name, we welcome the mystery of faith and the mystery of the way your spirit is at work, using each one of us to be a blessing, to build up the body. We do not understand this incredible mystery, Lord, but we come forward humbly to receive and to participate. And all God's people said, Amen. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And God's people said, Amen.
You join me as we pray. Lord, we give you thanks for all that you have done, for all that you are doing, for all that you will do. Help us to pay attention and grant that we might live in hope and in faith. And God's people said, amen. Please stand with us as we finish with two final songs. Your
We began our weekend with Beethoven, and why not end it that way? <laughs> All God's people said, amen. amen. For those of you that are very observant, you know that we've got a flower over here that stands for new birth. That is not about an actual human being born. That is about an amazing weekend where hopefully something new was born as we celebrate and look forward to Resurrection Sunday. VBS is coming. Save the date. Make sure if you've got a kid or if you want to come and have a lot of fun, come join us for the VBS week. Holy Week is coming up. You can rest all this week. After that comes Holy Week, we have Monday, Thursday at Cordata Presbyterian Church. We have Tenebrae, the service of darkness here. And then on Saturday, we have our annual Rocky Soil Scripture Show where we read through the whole Gospel of Mark with joy and imagination, creativity, and improvisation. Come join us. Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, will be on the 31st. As you go. And then our ride service next week. Mike is going to teach us how to use rideshare programs. This is incredibly important. As we get older, some of us may not be able to drive at some point. If you pay attention to Mike, you will be completely independent and go wherever you want if you know how to use a rideshare app. It's not scary, is it, Mike? Yep. It's not. It's not scary. Not scary. Very safe. Next week, you can learn how to use rideshare apps. Um, as you go, may you go out knowing that you are an artist 
God is growing something in you, and it needs to be shared with the people around you and with the world. Let us, in participation with the work of the Spirit, pay attention and go out and do what God is calling us to do with boldness, with creativity, and knowing that it might be wrong. And that's okay, because we are forgiven, and we can keep going and trying again. May you go with this blessing. And to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly, more than we could ask or even imagine by the power that is right now at work within us, to that God be the glory. And all God's people said, Amen. Make sure you shake hands with at least three and a half people. Zoom people, turn your microphones on.